This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to The Self-Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Okay, well, this is normally the part where I interview various experts in the field of leadership, coaching, neuroscience, behavior change, and all things well-being. But I've gotten some feedback from the listeners, and you've said that those solo rants that I do every once in a while, those are kind of cool. And some of you have even suggested I do that more often. Ranting more often is definitely something I can do. So I thought, hey, why not? Especially since this morning I was on a conference call, large meeting, and somebody brought up the subject around people insisting other people are normal or they conform. And this was a point of contention for her. And it has been for me as well. So I thought, yeah, this is a good subject to kind of discuss or if you like rant about, because you might not believe this, but when I was growing up, I heard the question, why can't you be like everyone else? I heard that quite a lot, actually. And many times I was tempted to ask myself the very same question. And I know I'm not alone. You know, many of us have received that same question, too many of us, as a matter of fact. And when people ask that question, I think what they're really asking is, why can't you be like us? Or why can't you be like me? Or the way I want you to be? A way that would make you more acceptable to me. And that's usually followed by well-meaning, but not so great advice. I mean, did you ever get advice by your parents that what you need to do to win in life is to go out and go to school and then get good grades? Because if you get good grades, you can get a good job. And why is that important? Because if you get a good job, you'll get benefits and, oh, security. Well, how's that working out for the mass of people today? And in essence, the message that we were all given in one way, shape, or form growing up is keep your head down, follow the rules, and you'll be rewarded. You'll get to become one of us. Sorry, but no thank you. One of the most useful abilities I think an individual can develop is the ability to observe and recognize patterns. As you observe the quote-unquote normal people in our society, people who took this advice, what do you see? Not always, but a lot of the time. Are they really rewarded? When you look up, go, go do a Google search on the definition of normal, and what you'll find is conforming to a standard, usual, typical, or expected. Henry David Thoreau once wrote that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. I mean, go out and if you meet five people that you happen to interact with just in the course of your day and you start off a conversation by saying something like, hey, how's it going? Sound familiar? I mean, four out of five people will say something in a state of exasperation, a state of exhaustion like, oh, getting by. It's another day in the grind or fine. I have a colleague that's fond of saying fine is not a feeling. Is that really it though? Is that our reward? If we follow the rules, we get to get by. The implicit message that I think we receive from society is that the worst thing that we can do if we desire acceptance and security, and we all do to varying degrees, But the worst thing we could do is be a dissenter. These people are the constructively dysfunctional members of society. Not the ones who conform, but the ones who are saying, "Nah, you know what? No thanks. I'm a little bit different and I'm okay with that. These are people who don't break the rules or bend the rules just to break them. It's They do it because they're not content with what is, but rather they're infatuated with what is possible. What happens when they're free to play and come alive in the appreciation of beauty or what they find most beautiful, what makes them feel alive while they're living? Counterintuitively, you know, it's the minority that serve as the catalyst for progression and elevation. 
I mean, whenever I see somebody doing something cool in their work life or their personal life, or I'm drawn to them, they're a little bit different. They're a little bit odd, as a matter of fact. I think for that reason, I'm titling this podcast as Eccentric Darwinism. Because personal evolution and cultural revolution, if you like, favors the dysfunctional. The non-conventional thinkers progressive. They're not protective of the status quo. You know, these people are facilitators of change rather than, you know, stuck in the despotism of change. I mean, have you ever felt that you have something that's uncommon about you? That somehow you're not exactly like everyone else. And even in some cases, you don't fit with everyone and everywhere. And if that's the case, because I think that's a lot of us, a lot more than are willing to admit it, that shouldn't discourage any of us, but rather convince us that our chances of doing something that again, makes us feel alive whilst we're living, our chances of contributing something in our life and to the people who are most important in it, it might be far above average. Common thought produces common outcomes. And here are five common dysfunctions of nonconformists and the coolest people that I know. And dysfunction number one is that they are, in fact, nonconformists. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that the hope of a secure and viable world lies with disciplined nonconformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, and brotherhood. Rupert Sheldrake is the pioneer of what's called morphogenic field or M-field theory, and he suggests that every breakthrough in thought creates an elevation of all thoughts that are in resonance with that level of consciousness. And regardless of your political views or sympathies, how many people in the United States during the 1960s could have imagined presidential nominee and later two-term president Barack Obama? So what practices are you sick and tired of adhering to simply because some guru said it or because that's quote unquote the way it's always been done? You ever hear that story of a mother and she's teaching her daughter like how to cook a meatloaf. They're having a huge family gathering later on that evening and meatloaf is on the menu and she's teaching her how to season the meatloaf, how to prepare the meatloaf. And before she puts the meatloaf into the oven, she cuts the ends off. Now, the little girl finds this fairly curious and says, Mom, why do you cut the ends off the meatloaf before you put it in the oven? And she says, well, that's the way I was always taught to do it by my mother. And this little girl just keeps saying, well, why? Why? You know, kids. And the mother finally says, you know what? Let me call my mother and ask her. So she calls her mother and asks, well, mom, when you were teaching me to make a meatloaf when I was a little girl, how come we always had to cut the ends off the meatloaf? Like, what does that do for the preparation and the taste of the meatloaf? And my grandmother said, well, I, I don't know. That's the way I was always taught. Now, it just so happened that the little girl's great grandmother was still alive. And a couple of days later, the grandmother still remembering the phone call, called her mother and said, Mom, why is it so important to cut the ends off a meatloaf when you're preparing it? And the mother laughed and said, no, it has nothing to do with the preparation of the meatloaf. It's just back when I was a little girl and I was learning how to cook meatloaf, our oven that we had was so small back then, you couldn't fit the whole meatloaf in the oven, so you had to cut the ends off. So conventional thinking may have a purpose, but it can also outlive that purpose. So dysfunction number two suffers from delusions. The functionally dysfunctional change agent doesn't simply get the conventional wisdom that says, okay, this is just the way it is. Let's go back in time a little bit to the turn of the century. Nope, not the 20th century, 21st. So in June of 2000, A.J. Laffley was an executive for Procter & Gamble. And he received a phone call from the, at that time, CEO, John Pepper. Now, John Pepper wanted to know if Laughley thought he had what it took to replace him as CEO of one of the largest well-known companies in the world. And of course, Laughley accepted. This was an opportunity of a lifetime. 
The only problem was that Procter & Gamble was experiencing some considerable challenges. Despite the fact that Procter & Gamble produced some of the most recognized name brand products in the world, products like Tide, Pampers, Crest, I mean, many others that we've all heard of, p and stock dropped 50% within the first two quarters of that year. So for a time, Procter & Gamble established its supremacy in the marketplace with the philosophy that its products were the key to the company's success. And not surprisingly, there weren't many people who would want to move away from that because that philosophy grew Procter & Gamble into a global giant. But Laffley thought that the key to success lied in the business philosophy that innovation should be customer-centric, not product-centric. So even though that philosophy served the company enormously well, it had gotten the company as far as it could take Procter & Gamble, and that philosophy was not going to take it further. As a matter of fact, a philosophy that contributed to a major competitive advantage was now a major global liability. In their book, The Game Changer, Ram Charan and A.J. Laffley writes that the most essential component to a game-changing innovation is deeply understanding your customer at both the rational and emotional level. Understanding a customer who's purchasing toothpaste at an emotional level. Okay, now that's pretty novel. If he could do that, I reckon we can as well. So how often is it as coaches, friends, family members, or human beings, do we come to conclusions about people, even conclusions about ourselves, but we fail to understand or, or even acknowledge the emotional drivers that are the, the very catalysts or the inhibitors of positive change in our lives? If there's a need to understand the emotions involved in the purchase of everyday products that P&G sells, how much more do we need to have an integrated understanding of not just the logical, but the emotional implications of our life strategies? Not, not just for people that we impact, but for ourselves. Past beliefs are not indicative of future realities. And, and what I mean by that is just because we followed certain beliefs and behaviors in the past doesn't mean that reflects what's actually required in the present. There's always a need to re-examine our practices and processes at any level if we desire to grow. Or as Laffley puts it, innovation is the foundation for controlling your destiny. The real source of sustainable competitive advantage and the most reliable engine of sustainable growth. Dysfunction number three has to be mania. Now, when I use these terms, I just want to be very clear that I'm in no way making light of people who are suffering from real clinical disorders. I'm just using this play on words to make a point at how non-conventional or even disruptive these mindsets are to the masses of people. So just a little disclaimer there. Peter Han, in his book, Nobody's to Somebody's, examined 100 of the most outstanding leaders and people of influence in our society back when that book was written not too long ago. He wanted to understand how did the most outstanding people in society become that way. And one of the key ingredients that he found all 100 people had in common, in addition to self-knowledge or self-awareness, was a sense of unbridled enthusiasm. If you ask most people what they're excited about, they, they'll look at you as if you've gone mad. Most people can't seem to get themselves off the couch and they can't seem to get themselves moving in any direction because their butts are too big. And, and I'm not talking about anatomically. I'm talking about psychologically. You know, I would, but I'm too old, but I'm too young but I'm too tired, but I have too much debt. And however that shows up for you, if your butt is too big, are you authentically living in alignment with your highest values or the values and expectations of someone else? And if so, who? And what was it that convinced you that those values and expectations were more valid than your own? I think to be truly immersed and rewarded, and, and for that matter, good at anything. We all need a reason 
bigger than our current emotional state. We even need a reason bigger than we are. Obsession, I'm sorry, (laughs) dysfunction, number four, is obsessive compulsive disorder. When you think of geniuses who have had a recent impact on our society and change the way we communicate and tangibly change the way we live, you can't help but think of Steve Jobs as someone who belongs on that short list. Among Steve Jobs' many admirable attributes, some people would have argued that Jobs possessed some attributes that were, well, not that admirable. Leander Caney in his book Inside Steve's Brain pointed out that although he was brilliant at creating an environment that encouraged collaboration, Steve Jobs was a rather difficult man to work with, and some people described him as a control freak who was perpetually dissatisfied. Perfectionism is the path to terminal procrastination. I don't think that when they're saying that he was never satisfied, that he was a perfectionist. If Steve Jobs was a perfectionist, the Apple one would still be in the design phase. Now, only the geekiest amongst us is going to know what I just was talking about. But anyway, maybe what Steve Jobs had instead was a deep appreciation for beauty and excellence, and he was uncompromising about it. Or maybe in some ways he was hard to deal with. Maybe it was both. In any case, his contribution is undeniable. I mean, any time half of us pick up our phone, it's literally staring us right in the face. One of my favorite essays is by Charles Baudelaire, when he says that one should always be drunk. That's all that matters. That's our one imperative need. So as not to feel time's horrible burden that breaks your shoulders and bows you down, you must get drunk without ceasing. But with what? With wine, poetry, or with virtue? As you choose, but get drunk. And he goes on to say later in that essay, so that you may not be the martyred slaves of time. Now, I didn't quite understand that when I first read it. I think I took it literally. And to be fair, I don't remember much more of what happened that year. But when I became sober, I read it again. And I I think he's saying that, you know, the antidote to perpetual despair and suffering or what Thoreau called a life of quiet desperation is in fact intoxication. Not physical intoxication, but also emotional, mental intoxication. I guess the question here is what aspect of life could you find so intoxicating? Think back in your past. You know, what has fascinated you? What's grabbed your attention? What's pulled you toward it by its very nature rather than you having to push yourself to engage with it? What's worth obsessing over? And dysfunction number five, multiple personalities. In his book, Jump Curve, 50 Essential Strategies to Help Your Company Stay Ahead of Emerging Technologies, author Jack Aldridge predicted by the year 2050, okay, not exactly an eternity from now, listen to this, the sum of knowledge we possess today might not even amount to 1% of the total knowledge we will possess. What's more, Aldrich pointed out that it took the telephone 35 years to be adapted and embraced by the population, yet it only took the personal computer 16 years and the internet just seven years to be adapted. I mean, it took Netflix, not even all of 2020, to become part of our collective consciousness. As technology and knowledge starts to grow exponentially, as it has been, starts to, it's been growing exponentially, but so does the risk that regardless of our past successes, you know, a lot of us can find ourselves obsolete very quickly. And I'm not saying that like, oh, we have to continually, you know, grow and learn because we do, but I'm saying even, even how we navigate through our life is going to change. So the mental models that have served us in the past, again, like PNG's products back in the year 2000 and and its driving philosophy might be the very thing that frustrates us, that cripples us in the present and and denies us of a future that we can be passionate about. 
So functionally dysfunctional people, they're not bound by the mantra, this is who I am, as they're more interested in who they're capable of becoming and playing in that space. And I don't even think it's about just getting better, but rather a deeper exploration and appreciation of what makes me and you different. The late great Jerry Garcia said that you do not merely want to be known as the best of the best. You want to be considered the only ones who do what you do. Continual exploration, learning, and the acquisition of new skills is not something this type of person does. It's who they are. And I'm not talking about someone who hustles, grinds, and they get to where they are because they're willing to work for it and you're not. You know, many people work hard. That's not my point. And I'm not really getting into that self-congratulatory bullshit that's disguised as this thinly veiled attempt to appear to be dispensing sage wisdom and motivation. Just in case you were unclear. What I am talking about is the person who's authentically in love with learning and development. They're enthralled by it and willing to suffer for the cultivation of it. Not that they can do it so they can possess more knowledge, but rather so that they can give it away with reckless abandon. The more these types of people learn, the more they can give. And the more that they give, the more valuable they become, not only to others, but to themselves. These people evolve into what we can only describe as a grow giver. So, Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed the content on this podcast, give us a review, maybe even five stars. <laughs> it really does help. And you can find the self-help antidote um, on Instagram and DM me if you like. Let me know your thoughts around what guests, what topics and insights you'd like us to explore in the future. <laughs>